Yes, hi. It's Jonathan Bostock here, Birmingham Gems, and we're at the Prince of Wales for our first fireside chat. We are delighted to have as our first guest Dr. Willard Wigan, MBE, renowned micro sculptor, who, amongst other customers, has Her Majesty the Queen. I am autistic. I was, I was diagnosed when I was 50. So I started school in 1962. Uh, back then, autism wasn't, then they didn't know what autism was. It wasn't diagnosed then. It was just not quite understood. So, well, the word not quite, they didn't understand it. You know, when I was at school, it was very difficult for me because I, you know, I felt, I didn't have any confidence anyway because I, I, I just felt um, like a leaf in a cul-de-sac. You know, I didn't feel as though I'd, I'd fit in <coughs> because my mother used to try to get me to spell and I couldn't spell. And my mother used to get a bit upset about that. And I remember the first day at school, I never really felt right there. Straight as soon as I walked into school, you know, you smell the paintwork and, you know, you, you see lots of kids running around the playground and, and, you know, I felt a bit lost for some reason before the teachers even found out I couldn't read or write. But when the time came for us to learn lessons, you know, and then I was, um, I suppose that they uncovered the fact that I couldn't read. So that became, uh, I became an exhibit from one of the teachers. Quite a few of the teachers, actually. I mean, not all teachers are bad, we know that, but back in the 60s, if you couldn't read, you, you'd be an exhibit of failure, you know, and, and uh, one of the teachers uh, decided to use me as that, you know. And uh, being a young kid, it's easy to... Um, the only word I can use is when somebody tells you something enough times you believe it. You know, you can discourage them very easily. So as soon as I was exposed to the whole class, I remember she said to the kids in the school, after she said what she said in the class, she decided to take me around the school because I couldn't spell my name. She picked up my exercise book and held it up and said to the kids, this is what happens if you don't listen to the teacher, you become Willard. Mm. You know, and Willard is what you shouldn't become. Mm. Because when you leave school, you'll never get a good job and you'll never... She said it so the kids could actually understand. So that, to me, that crucified me. You know, so that traumatised me. I'm now, it's all over for me now. So, uh, uh, you know, now my left leg's in school, my right leg's out. <laughs> so the only thing that's in my, my body's there, my mind isn't, it's all over. Yeah. Because, and then she took it a little bit step further, took me around the whole school, yeah. told all the rest of the kids, oh, this, look at Willard's work, look how disgusting he is. This is what happens when you look at that. Look at his arithmetic, look at everything. So you're hearing it, it's like an echo, it's echoing in your head. You can hear it echoing and echoing and echoing. So now you're not listening, you don't care anymore because it's like, um, I didn't speak, I stopped speaking because I thought my voice is not going to be accepted. So you don't, ex I'm not accepted, so why should I talk? So that, that was uh, c complicated for me because I was trying to fit in, but then I was discouraged. So I decided that there's nothing else here that's going to help me anymore. When I went back into the classroom, after she took me around the school, into my particular class, and I was told to stand at the back of the class. And I remember looking out the window and seeing a little spider crawling a web outside the window. There's a spider's web, and I saw this spider going up and down. And I, could, and I could see insects moving around, and a, you know, and a butterfly flew by, and, and then a dragonfly, and then I was like, 
and I saw a little ant crawling around and I thought this is nice <laughs> so instead of it being a punish punishment it became a pleasure because I was looking at the trees and stuff I was looking at things you know I saw pied wagtail walking and I thought oh, I can do this all day you know I don't mind you telling me to stand at the back of the class before I knew it we can sit down come and sit down I sat down and then I was just for that moment I, I thought to myself I don't really need to be here so you know not too long afterwards I decided to run away from school you know it was a uh, it was something that I, I didn't think twice about I, I wanted to because I wasn't really there really you know so I remember the opportunity came for me to run away which I did it was a good feeling you see it was a nice sunny day you used to have the big yellow thing in the clouds called the sun it used to come out regularly in the 60s so we get a bit of sun now, everybody complains. <laughs> Back then, as you know, it was uh, it came out a lot. You know, you get a nice balance. So, um, yeah, and I remember crawling under the fence and I just kept running and it was a nice feeling, you know. And it was, it was great. You know, nobody seen me do it, it was quite sly the way I did it. And there used to be a field by me and I remember running you know, running through the field over the park and I saw my house in the distance and I, there was a pond where I used to live and, uh, and I remember sitting by the pond looking into the water and seeing all the pond creatures swimming on the top the water boat and the whirly beetles and like little motor boats you know, Formula One racing cars <laughs> It was, it was great looking at that. And I, I remember that at the edge of the pond there, it was slightly shallow, it went cloudy, and there was a big crested newt swimming. And I saw this blue thing looks like a flying brooch. It was like a damselfly, and I was flying around. It was like. And for that moment, John, I was, I was in my world. I found me for that second, few, few minutes. I, was, I found myself. And you know, I felt tranquility, solitude. Nobody's saying anything to me anymore. You know, the insects are not gonna say anything to me. The leaves are not gonna say anything to me. The newt's not gonna say anything bad to me. The butterflies ain't gonna say nothing bad. So all it is is just the wind, sun, and wildlife, you know, things floating around in the air. You know, dandelions floating around, and I, I just, just became fascinated with that. I wasn't thinking about whether anybody thinks, uh, what anybody thinks about me uh, doing that, because nobody knew what or why I was doing it. Or, I mean, for that moment, I didn't know why I was doing it, but I felt happy doing it because it was quiet, you know, there's no humiliation. I remember I, I picked up this brick and there's a purple beetle, about that big. Yeah, they're, they're like, you see in your garden sometimes, they're quite big, beautiful colour. And I grabbed him by the shell and picked it up and I was looking at it and his legs were going like that and his mouth was going. And I, and I, looked, and I kept thinking, I wonder if he can sing, because of the pop group, the Beatles. <laughs> so I put this beetle by my ear to see if I could hear him singing. Yeah. I could hear his legs and scratching my ears and stuff. Yeah. And I kept thinking, why won't he sing? Because you know, because when you're autistic, you yeah. you literally believe that the Beatles got it because they heard Beatles singing. You know. So I thought perhaps you'd need four Beatles. So I was looking for other little beetles and holding my hand and singing to them, thinking I could hear them sing. They never sang a word, not a word. <laughs> so I put them down, let them go, you know. I'm sure I heard one of them say, thank you, Willard. 
<laughs> I'm sure I heard one of them speak. <laughs> but you know, as a kid, you know, yeah. you, you live in a fantasy world. Yes. And you believe that little insects and things, that they all had their little environment, their, their community, and they were like us, but in a small way, you see. So, you know, I, I carried on walking towards my house. I could see my house in the distance. The closer I got to my house, the little bit, I was a little bit afraid. Because, you know, if my mum found out I'd run away from school, you know. See, my mum was a type of woman, she was a good woman, but she's a disciplinarian, you know. If you did something wrong, you'd know. See, if my mum threw a punch at you and it missed you, you'd get pneumonia off the draft. <laughs> she, my mum was like the woman in Tom and Jerry, you know. If you did something, you'd know. In the 60s, parents would discipline their kids. Yeah. Even other parents give you a good idea if you did something wrong. You know, it was allowed to. It was called discipline. But you see, as I got closer to my house, I was thinking, is my mum there? My mum used to work part-time. So I got closer to the house. And I climbed over the fence, you see. And we used to have a shed. And uh, I remember hiding in the shed, in the back garden, and then... Uh, the shed had a little notch in it, so you could, you know, the wooden sheds have got a little, some, sometimes the notches fall out, you know. And I remember I could look through the notch and I could see the kitchen, see my mum's there, you know. But my mum had gone to work. So I was, uh, I said to myself, my mum's not there. That's good. Then I heard the door scratching it we had a dog called Maxie and Maxie was scratching the door you know when a dog wants to play you got no choice <laughs> so he had a ball in his mouth I want to play I want to play you know all right then so I'm bouncing the ball and he, come on then and then I bounced the ball he went over the next door neighbor's fence then he ran tried to jump over the fence, because he's only a little dog, and then he couldn't. Then he started digging underneath the fence. And as he'd as he done that, disturbed the whole ant's nest. And lots of ants came out of the ground, and it made me feel sad. I started to cry. I felt really upset. Because I kept thinking, all the ants have got nowhere to live. See, autism is a strange thing, you know. You believe... when you, I saw a programme called Hoppity Goes to Town, and... You know, and it's and all these little ants are there, these cartoons of the ants and stuff, and carrying leaves and things. And I, and I kept thinking, all the ants are going to cry, and the queen ants got nowhere to live, and all the little baby ants have got no school to go to. And so my, my mind was like, oh, I, I need to, t to help the ants. So what did I do? And my mum, well, in the sixties, you used to leave your door open. People did. That's what they did. And I went into the house and I went upstairs and I got my dad's razor blade, blue Gillette. My dad would discard his razor blades and sometimes they'd be all over the place. And so I took a blue Gillette razor blade. And they were, like, they were built to last then in the 60s, and they just did. And uh, I got a twig and I put it in, into the blade and snapped a piece of razor blade off. I had a shard of blade in my hand. And I went back downstairs, ran up the garden to where all the ants were. I found a piece of cardboard because I, I was going to build all the houses on that cardboard, you see, John. So what I did, I, I, I picked up this, this uh, little bits of wood and I started to slice them and cut little grooves in them and push all these splinters together with their own friction, pulling bits of my school uniform out and tying little knots and, and, and just building and constructing. And I didn't think it was any uh, talent what I had. I never thought it was, but I could just do it, you see. And then, and then I built lots of little, all these little houses. I was punching holes in the cardboard, wedging little bits of splinters in, and wedging the houses in between them. And uh, you know, I was just I could just do it, you know. And, and before I knew, it, I built a village for ants. Then I thought the queen ant needed a palace. So what I did, I, I found a leaf and then I twirled the leaf around and pulled out bits of uniform and, and you know the fibres and the thread and tied it all, tied it all together cut out little arch windows, and I got four, they look like ice cream cones, all pushed together with splinters to hold them to the turrets of the palace, and 
could take a little large way and and I, you know because I, I used to see Cinderella on TV and things you know and just photographic memory was there and I pushed the splinters all four splinters and held them in into the position so there was a queen's palace in the middle and then I I got carried away and I thought the ants need furniture so I made <laughs> so I made little tables and chairs and beds and punched it all got my knee got my mum's needle and punched little holes at the side of a, a leaf and then pushed splinters in each corner of the leaf and made little chairs and tables and you know pushed them into the cardboard and I, you know I, I was just 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 doing it didn't know it was anything special I just did it and I thought the ants are going to move in now and, and they're going to be happy and you know, and I, used to, I started talking to the ants, saying, I'm sorry I didn't mean my dog to do that, I'm sorry the ants, you know, and you know, all that stuff, you know. And then uh, I went and got some sugar and, you know, icing sugar off my mum's cake and put little bits around and all the ants were there eating. You could see the little mouse going, thanks my lad, thanks my lad, you know what I mean? Because that's what I used to believe, they were, I believed that they were speaking to me. Yeah. Because I used to speak to them, I believed yeah. that. So, you know, then, before I knew it, you know, time moved on. And, you know, I, I never... Th time didn't kind of matter, because it just went... I couldn't tell the time anyway, I didn't know what time was about. And then, uh, all of a sudden, you know, this, a lot of school bell went up and all the kids were coming home, and I was just behind the, the fence, the, the, their fence is here, and... In the 60s, it was all these grey fences with the wire going through. Neighbours used to have a chat over the fence and talk to each other, you know. Oh, where's Mary? I'm not too bad. Bought some new shoes for our Karen, have you really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I need to get some for myself, you know, that type of conversation. You know, and it was all all that, you know, community spirit was there, you know what I mean? And I, I remember um, what happened after that. I remember the, 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 one of the kids come home next door, skipping up the garden path and... Yeah, and, uh, and I'm sitting there like that in the garden, you know, looking at what I'd done, you know, and feeding the ants. And she comes skipping up the garden and she stopped and looked and looked over the fence. And then she said, she said, uh, what's that? She looked over the fence and she went, <gasps> wow, that's the bestest. Um. Now, when I heard that word, that was a transformation for me. That was it. That resonated in my mind. It was almost like uh, I, when she told me I was the bestest. It's like being in a shower, and each droplet of water in that shower washed away everything negative that was said to me about mm -hmm. said to me by the school teacher. And I washed myself in that encouragement. I washed myself. You know, and I was like, and she went, "That's the bestest. How do you do that?" Run up a garden, run up the garden. Mom, mom, look at this. And mom come down the garden and she looked over the fence. She went, "Oh my God, that is absolutely fantastic. How do you do that? That's amazing." One told the neighbours over the other fence, "Have a look at this." They're all going, "Wow." That's incredible. You have a lady on the other side and a lady on the other side and she came in. And it's like, oh my God, amazing. It was like, I was in the shower again, you see. I was in a sauna after that, you know what I mean? It, it just cleansed me of everything. And now, what they've just done, they've just planted the seed for me to become the greatest micro artist of all time. But what brought it really home to me is when my mum came back. She was about to give me a good idea. <laughs> but I was rescued by my neighbour. You see, my mum, when she gave you a good idea, she'd tell you a story while she's hitting you. She didn't just hit you, she'd tell you a story, you know. So, you know I came to England in 1955, and I remember when I was breaking a kick, and I... You know, it's nothing to do with me, but she'd tell you something, you know what I mean? I made an apple pie six months ago. You know, you know, you know, that's the Jamaicans, you know. You know, they, 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 you would get that. 
And you'd learn to dance as well. Mm. I learned to nourish dance, I did river dance, body popping, <laughs> all in one, you know, because you, you're being hit. Doesn't matter what you say, you're going to get it. But she never did, because my neighbour rescued me. And they, oh, Mrs. Wigan, I'll go to you. And then she said, look at that, look at that. Look what he's done, and my mum looked at it, and my mum, she was kind of stunned into silence. She didn't say anything. I saw her looking like that. And then she looked at me and looked again. And she said, bring them come, bring it, and have a look. Those who don't understand Patwa, bring it here, let me have a look. <laughs> you know, translate it for you. So, um, what she'd done, I, I took all the little the little houses and the piece of cardboard and those little ants crawling over and everything. And she, I remember she, she put it on the kitchen table and my mum looked at it and she went, if you make them, make them smaller and your name get bigger. Mm -hmm. She said, you make small things, make small things. But she'd say, things. You know, the Irish and the blacks have that same, oh, that's a nice thing. Make them, you know what I mean? Make them smaller. Yeah. Small thing. So I, when my mum told me that, that was the cherry on the cake. Because that's it now. I'm now on a journey now. And I said to myself that I, I must make little things. But I, I had to make these little things be better than anything anyone's ever seen in my head, you know, because it's like... That's what autism does, you see, because it's like you, you, you're defending, you have to defend yourself, you're going to somehow do something to, so people can, so they won't see you in, 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 in a negative way. You, you've got to start being the best you, you can be, or... It's, it's, you take it to an extreme, an extremity. You see what I mean? You start developing other skills. Mm. You know, it's like God throws you the gift and you catch it. Yeah. And then you open it up. Then what he does, it penetrates you. And you, you start, it can, you know, it penetrates your mind, your brain, and then you think, wow. And then you think, oh, well, I've got to do other things. So. So when my mum told me that, I, I, I picked up a toothpick and I, and I got my dad's razor blade and I carved Beatrix Potter characters all over it. And I carved a little bird on the top and I, I showed my mum, mm, too big man, too big. And I, What's the matter? What's the matter? Too big man. And her eyes used to do that. But I knew what, I didn't know what she was doing then, but as you get older you know she's yeah. pushing you. So I thought, I thought, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do? Started carving splinters. I went mental, went upstairs and started carving everything. I thought I was going to carve myself at one stage. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I was just carving everything, everything, everything. And, you know, when I was doing that, my sisters, my brothers, seen it. And they're going, wow, wow, wow. I showed some of the kids down the street. There, wow, oh my God, wow, brilliant, fantastic, brilliant. And it was like, okay. Yeah. Now that's it now. That's me. I've now found me. When I went back to school, the headmaster, one of the girls told the headmaster what I'd made, you see. I'd made a little rabbit, a Welsh teacher. And he saw it. <gasps> oh my god boy oh. you know and he was like that's amazing and he said did you really do that I said yeah and he was like he said I did this I did that he said he was telling me that that I'm the best at this and then it, then it was it was almost like uh, that that was when I started to think perhaps this is what I'm going to do yeah you see yeah and plus he liked Paul Robeson because <laughs> he told me Paul Robeson came to Wales to sing with the choir and all that yeah. so he liked me because if he liked Paul Robeson and stuff, he liked all that type of singing. So I was like, I was all right, I was okay. So through through school, I was, you know, I was never really there. I was just there, you know. When I went from junior school to senior school, 
you know, I, I didn't really excel, you know, in any, any, any academics, I, even the art. I never wanted to do anything. Didn't want to. Mm -hmm. I was just there. Because everything was taken out of me. It was all, you know, I wasn't encouraged with school. So all I was thinking about is making little sculptures. I was interested in the school dinners. Yeah. You know, the, the school dinners, especially the apple crumble. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it was like simple things. I, I weren't bothered anymore. I was just going through through that. And throughout school, it was just a, like I said, it was just a leaf blowing, you know. Uh, but I kept it dormant. I didn't show many kids too much you know there's one girl I showed and she went and told the other kids and they all wanted to give me freppens to have a look at what I did you know that was a Peter Rabbit on a toothpick and my pocket was getting full of frepences so I used to give it back to them because it was their biscuit money or something you know so so you know it was like I was now finding who I was you know and all the way through my senior school it was just listening to music you know, Tamla Motown and joining with the other kids. I, you know, I got on with the kids at school. We all got on together. But the teachers, you know, there were a lot of those were bullies. Some of the teachers were bullies. Mm -hmm. So when they were bullying me, I just thought, okay, well, do your worst then. I'm not bothered. I'm not bothered at all, you know. So, you know, like I said, I ain't, I ain't bothered. School didn't mean anything to me. I left school without being able to read properly. I had uh, the condition which I... Like I said, with autism, I was very confused, disorientated. I was, but I was. When I left school, uh, I, I was happy because I left school, even though I didn't have any qualifications. Well, what a fascinating story from a highly inspirational man. Willard Wigan is, without question, one of our Birmingham gems. Many thanks to Joe of the Prince of Wales and of course this is not the end of Willard's story. There is more fireside chats to come. <laughs>